Oh, here you are. You took your time, didn't you? We've all fight to get these, didn't we? Oh, yeah. Enjoy your tea. <laughs> and we'll give us hand. All right? Marked on the plan. Sewerage? No. Oh, yeah, it could be from the smell. No, sewerage and front panels are clearly marked, and there should be nothing under here. Oh, well, please yourself. Now, what you been doing? Digging holes. What do you think? What you got in it? You want a brains. Let's have a look inside, then. After you, then. Right. I'm not afraid of the dark. Don't mind a bogey man, would you? has beaten you to it. He's down there already. Any lights in the place? Well, I've got some battery lanterns rigged up. We can get you some more if you want them. Is it a cellar? Oh, we don't really know. It's right under us now, about ten foot down. Not marked on the original plans. According to the site foreman, there shouldn't be anything there at all. It's down there. Completely sealed off. What was this place? Lino factory. Only put it up in 46. Yeah, progress. Oh, oh Dr. Brinsler, I presume. Yeah. Do me a favor, Kingo. Try and arrange to find your skeletons in more accessible places next time, will you? Smells like the black hole of Calcutta in there. Chief Superintendent, this is Mr. Jackson, the site for the Sergeant Ward. Mr. Jackson. Afternoon. You ought to be wearing safety on this down here, you know. Got some nasty cracks in that ceiling. There's uh, been a lot of heavy stuff over this ground. It could be a bit dicey. I'll get you some safety helmets and stop all the heavy equipment moving overhead. Thank you. Look, I don't want to tell you your job, mate, but I've uh, got a nasty feeling about that roof down there, so keep everything away from here, will you? Well, look, let's chance a quick look in while we're waiting. It's up to you. Male skeleton. <coughs> Probably down here a couple of dozen years or so. 
Constable Scully was shot through the head. There's an old service revolver just over there. That's all I'm prepared to say at the moment. All right, well, I'll have it sent over to the mortuary as soon as we've finished here. Good, I want to take some pictures first. I'll have to get the camera. Keep everybody else out of here until we've finished. No, no, sir. We won't be here long, I hope. What a thing about holes in the ground. Bless you. Skeletons for company. Right, lads. I want you to see everybody around that lift shaft's got one of these helmets on. What's that? That bloody copper doing it's one of their wagons, hey! Stop all that. Let's get out of here. coming down. I very nearly did. It might still do. Well, at least we've still got some light. Wait for them to dig us out. Come on, stand down, Rodham. It's very dicey. A bit bloody late with them, aren't you? Well, we'll have to shift it all by hand. Oh, you must be joking. Not going to fetch a crane over the top. Get all the buckets you can find and be quick about it. It'll take some time. Think they're getting any air in there. Hello? Yeah? What I said before about not liking holes in the ground. Yeah. I wasn't kidding. I'm not crazy about them myself. I mean, I'm not too keen about being shut in, you know? I've always been that way. I think maybe I'm, I'm claustrophobic. 
I doubt it. You'd have been screaming the place down, tearing up the walls long before this. Well, let me get to that yet. Look, they'll have us out in a matter of minutes. We just have to sit tight, that's Come all. Look, you, you, you notice anything about this place? Well, it's not my idea of a room with the Ritz, I know that. Has no door. Not now, I grant you. I don't think it ever had one. Look at the walls. So? So that's an interesting problem, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, how did the body get in here? I don't know. For the moment, I don't care. What sort of a cellar is it? That has no door, no access, no means of getting in or out. Come on. Let's get on with the job. You must be joking. Now, come on, we might as well get on with it while well, we're waiting. It's better than just sitting you, here, no, isn't it? No, I'm not one of your death and glory boys who sings a bye with me as the ship goes down. I'm more... I'm more your how the place down type. Oh, you do any howling in here, you really will bring the place down. They know we're here. They know the situation. They'll get us out. I don't hear anything. Oh, well. There's a pretty effective wall between us and the outside. Right. Air. Well, air? Have you thought about air? We're using it up in lungfuls. There's no more getting in. We're going to suffocate. <laughs> I doubt it. What makes you an authority? That lives here. That has to breathe too. You can. to me we have a unique opportunity to get right back to the basics of police work. See how much progress we can make using pure deduction and observation. No forensic aids, no scientific help, just the bare situation. Cool car we're collected, eh? Take it nice and easy. Anyone would think you were giving a lecture at the police college rather than sitting in a filthy cellar with that thing grinning up at you? It's not a cellar. So? So find out what it is. What? Find out what this place is. Examine every inch of the room. Tell me what you deduce. Observe, analyze, and report. Now. Now, listen. Do it! Waste of bloody time. It needn't be. See what we've got for a start. The body is that of an adult male. Cause of death, gunshot wound in the right temple. Could have happened roughly 25 years ago. Weapon used? Probably this. Service revolver here. Smith and Wesson. 38 calibre, still loaded. One shot fired. Lying about eight feet from the body. Seems to rule out the possibility of suicide. Keep going. <laughs> you sweating on the police medal or something, Gov? Just get on with your work. Look, I don't care what you say. I don't think there is any air getting in here. I think that rat came in when we did. And he's going to go out feet first like him, like us. Look at the position of the body. Huh? Arms outstretched above his head. Attitude of surrender. When you've got a gun pointing at your head is the best way to be. Oh, but you wouldn't fall like that. Well, how did he get here in the first place? There's no way in, no way out. If it's, <coughs> if it's murder, how did the killer get out? Well, three walls of concrete, one of brick. Brick wall looks fairly solid. Shoddy bit of work. Laid from the outside. There's some holes in the wall and some 
sort of thin open pipes. Sort of inlets or something. Yeah, for what? I don't know. Ducks, cables. Yeah, so it never was an ordinary cellar, even before it was bricked up. What else? Uh, dirt floor with some concrete slabs set in it. Yeah. So what is it? Well, it looks as though they were going to put in some heavy machinery. Power plant? Generator, maybe? They discarded the idea. Yeah, and then bricked the place up. After they dumped our friend here. Yeah. He's not surrendering. Huh? He was dragged in by his arms. Yeah, and the gun thrown in after him. Now. Now. See if we can find out who he was. Who? There's nothing left of him. There's a ring. Signet ring. Crest of some sort on it. Twenty-ninth Light Dragoons, I think. What? It's a regiment, cavalry regiment. Oh, you fought and bled with them in the war. No, but I used to collect army badges when I was a kid. How many men have served in that regiment over the years? Twenty-five years ago, he probably served during the war. Mostly officers who take to wearing signet rings. Twenty-ninth Light Dragoons? Yeah. An officer? Upper crust, probably. Though not necessarily so in wartime. As what do I know about the 29th? Desert, I think. Western desert. Armoured cars. I'm not absolutely sure, but so I think so. He was a soldier. Well, so. Or an ex soldier. What's the matter with you up there? Asleep or something? A soldier or ex soldier killed with a soldier's gun. That must be significant. Serial number's still on it, so it could be traced. Not by us. Right. I'm sorry, but I don't think we're going to get out of here. Not before that lock comes down. Around 40 minutes. They've given up. If they think the whole lot's gone down, they... They might think there's no need to hurry. It is getting worse. I'm gonna have another go. Stay where you are! Why don't you do as you're told? The light's dimming. I'd better conserve the batteries. I'm not going to sit here in the dark! Well, he's been in the dark for two and a half decades. Well, he's in no condition to complain, is he? I wish we had something to cover it with. 29th Light Dragoons. Might not be his ring. We should have found more of his personal belongings. I mean, everything doesn't rot. He surely must have been carrying money or keys or Maybe something. Maybe he wasn't wearing anything. Yeah, pyjamas. If he'd been wearing pyjamas, that might give some indication of the time of death. A few more minutes of this and... I'm really going to do my nut. Judging from the wound, the gun was fired from very close range. Almost point blank, I should think. Indicates the possibility of suicide. Oh, that's right, Gunner. He blows his brains out, crawls in here, walls himself up, throws the gun away and dies laughing. 
That's because he's got a sense of humour. He knows that a quarter of a bloody century later, two stupid coppers are going to go out of their mind wondering how the hell he did it. I said it indicated the possibility of suicide. I didn't say it was. Earlier, you ruled out suicide altogether. Every aspect has to be explored. Well, look, do me a favour, will you? Stop exploring! Use that massive brain of yours figuring a way to get a way out of here. All we can do is just sit tight and give up. Looks as if you've done that already. I'll hold out as long as you. How's it going? Impossible to say. Could be through in a couple of minutes or a couple of hours. There's nine feet of rubble up there. And the rest of it come, come through any time. Come on. It's a pretty good hiding place. I reckon there must have been a bricklayer involved, though. I don't think an amateur could have laid that wall. Listen. About shooting my mouth off. Oh, forget it. How long now? Just about three hours. Oh. They always look as though they're grinning at you, don't they, skulls? <coughs> Fellow of infinite guess. <laughs> Classical nightmare situation, trapped inside four walls with a corpse. Look, we're not getting anywhere like this, are we? They've been down for two and a half hours now. We've got to do something to get them out. Listen, if we can hear them, they must be nearly through. That wall's coming down. That corner of the safe. Let's get over there. Get any sleep? I woke up yelling a couple of times. What have you got there? The revolver was issued to Second Lieutenant Terence Parker of the 29th Light Dragoons in 1940. When he was demobbed as a captain, he reported it lost in action. Obviously, he held on to it. 29th Light Dragoons? Yes. And Terence Parker? Reported missing in February 1946. Oh, where'd you get that from? Uh, they found a relative, a Mrs. Parker. Aunt by marriage. Old lady in her 80s, widow. Lives in Twickenham. It was her husband, the uncle, who reported Parker missing. Where did Parker live? Uh, he owned a house in Teddington, down by the river. Nice house. Nice spot, by all accounts. What did he do for a living? Well, when I spoke to the aunt, she said he never did a hand's turn, but always seemed to have plenty of money. I don't think she liked him very much. He could have been bent. Mm. Better get a full statement from her, then check with CRO and correspondence registry. Right. right. Pathologist report. Time of death could well be February 1946. And the cause of death? Well, it wouldn't be in the right temple. Yeah. Shot with his own gun. Keep coming back to suicide. Mm. Except the gun was ten feet away. Mm. Now, about those brick blares working on the construction at the time, that's not going to be easy. We got in touch with the contractors, uh, McConnelly and Donnelly, but... Uh, they said they'll check through their records, but it was a long time ago. Mm. Now, this place in Teddington, Parker must have had neighbours, somebody who knew something about him. Mm. See what you can rake up there, and don't forget a full statement from the aunt. We lived with Terence Parker, if that's who it was, for nearly three hours. I want to know how he died and who killed him, but most of all, I want to know all about him. Hello? Is that Madison and Witten? Can I speak to Mr. George Madison, please? It's Lady Oxborough. Well, thank you, Miss Hardesty. Yes, Lady Oxborough. 
Yes, I know. Oh, yes, of course, I understand perfectly. Well, I'll see what can be done. No, 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 don't you worry. Yes, I'll keep you informed. Yes, bye. <sighs> Miss Hardesty, would you get on to the House of Commons, please? Find out if Mr. Hugh Brunton is available. I'd like to speak with him as soon as possible. Well, that's the way it's going to be. Morning, Governor. Morning. Anything? A thin shaft of daylight. Ah, from the aunt? No, from one of Parker's neighbours, a Mrs. Joyce Bentley. And she was a talker. Good. Yes, yeah, she reckons Parker was a bit of a mystery man, kept himself very much to himself. But she did mention that he had a steady girlfriend. Ah. Yes, Dorothy Hamlin, ex-deb type. Seen at Ascot, dining in Mayfair, hunting in the Shires. A William Hickey special, all the rage in 1940. Expensive, sleek... Well-groomed, you know the sort. No, I don't know the sort, actually. Not personally. Yeah. Anyway, she dropped out of the world fairly abruptly in January 1945. She went all respectable and married Sir Geoffrey Oxborough, who's now a very big wheel in the Foreign Office. Oxborough? Page 425. Thank you. Oxborough served in the 29th. Perhaps you should pay a call on Lady Oxborough. I can't wait. Now, anything on Parker from correspondence registry? Yes, quite a lot. He was involved in smuggling activities just after the war, black market stuff mostly, but he did mess about with a few consignments of medical supplies. Customs clobbered one of his cargoes in December 1945, 40,000 quids worth. They think he paid for it in cash. Oh, no wonder he could afford Dorothy Hamlin. Was he lumbered? Yeah. Never came to trial, insufficient evidence. They called some of the small fry. Nice company we kept down there. Still, you always had a feeling it was bent. Law-abiding citizens don't usually get their brains blown out. <laughs> don't they? Have you read your Times this morning? No, not yet. Well, you should have done. Yes, yes. Letters to the editor. There. Oh, from Hugh Brunton, MP. That's the one. Uh, at a time when the crime rate in London is reaching crisis proportions, we have to suffer the spectacle of our police force wasting their time and energy on the investigation of a crime, if indeed there ever was a crime, which was committed long before many of my constituents were even born. Oh, Hugh Brunton, MP. The damn fool of a backbencher. Yeah. But he's not usually a parliamentary police baiter, is he? usually leaves us alone. And why does he suddenly decide... Did you look him up? No. Brunton... It's that regiment again. Brunton? Oxborough? Parker. Now there's an ill-assorted trio. I'm sorry, but I really can't help you. My husband is returning from Geneva tomorrow morning. I But you so... don't deny that you knew Terence Parker, do you, Lady Oxborough? I'm neither admitting nor denying anything. Madam, we are looking into the background of Terence Parker. Twenty-nine flight dragoons. Amalgamated now, aren't they, though? Like so many regiments. Shame, really. All those great traditions. Yes, but then we're losing so much that is good and valuable these days, aren't we? Yes, I suppose so. Your husband's regiment? Yes. Was he a serving officer when you met him? Yes. Ah. Splendid dress uniforms they used to wear, didn't they? Well, they still do. Your husband was a regular, I take it? Of course. Like Terence Parker? He certainly wasn't a regular officer. No decent regiment would have taken him in peace. I'm afraid we have a habit of doing that. Mostly when we don't get direct answers to direct questions. Uh, Lady Oxborough, I apologise, but now that we have uh, broken the ice, as it were, you could help us a great deal. May I assure you of our discretion? Please, will you sit down? Thank you. Yes, I knew Terence Parker. Knew him well? Too well. 
He was a most fascinating man when you first met him. Good-looking, amusing, very exciting. But... But what? A bastard when you got to know him. Vicious and unprincipled. But he had money. Well, apparently an unlimited supply. What was his source of income? I don't know. When he came out of the army in 1945, he bought a house at Teddington. Actually paid for it in cash with a bundle of banknotes. Even then, I thought that rather vulgar. What about his friends and associates? As far as I know, he had no real friends. There were always a lot of scroungers hanging around, but even they used to vanish when he went into one of his tantrums. Tantrum? Oh, yes. He had a perfectly vile temper. It exploded sometimes without warning, just flared up. Afterwards, he used to make the excuse that it was his stomach. Chronic dyspepsia or something. Probably too much brandy. Drank like a fish. But you stayed with him for some time? Nearly two years. Do you know how it is when you're young and foolish? And there were times when he was utterly charming. But all that ended when you met Sir Geoffrey? Yes. It was a regimental ladies' night. Terence Parker took me. Oh, so he kept in touch with the regiment afterwards? Yes, but he was always an outsider. He went to their functions regardless of whether he'd been invited. That's the sort he was. Ugh, despicable. Terence Parker was like a disease. Something I, I couldn't get out of my system. If you were a woman, you might understand. God knows I tried hard enough to leave him. Time and time again I walked out. Is there anything else you want to know? I suppose you don't happen to have an old photograph of Parker anywhere, do you? One that you've forgotten to throw away. <laughs> After all this time, and with a man who's been dead for 25 years, now there's a motive. Oh, for your information, ladies seldom choose heavy service revolvers as murder weapons. Well, she needn't have done it herself. She was the darling of the regiment, perhaps some dashing captain of dragoons obliged. She only knew two of them. As far as we know. Were you the two men trapped in that cellar? Yes. Unpleasant, I imagine. It wasn't nice. No. Hmm. He looks a lot better there than when we last saw him. You have about as much taft and subtlety as a runaway bulldozer. Good morning. Thank you. It gets you, doesn't it? Obsessional. Yeah. About all these regimental lists and histories. It, do you know who commanded the 29th during most of the war? Lieutenant Colonel Giles Wentworth. Now Lieutenant General Sir Giles Wentworth, KBE, VC, DSO and Bar, retired, still Colonel-in-Chief. I don't know why I bother. Did some homework. Mm. You going to talk to him? No, not yet. Just wondered, because he's going to be in London the day after tomorrow. On the 25th of July, 1942, the armoured cars of the 29th Light Dragoons were on reconnaissance in the Western Desert. While isolated from the rest of their division, they sighted three large panzer columns of the Africa Corps. In order to give their division time to reach defensive positions, they charged the tanks in true cavalry fashion, fought them to a standstill, although vastly outnumbered. On that same day, every year, the regiment commemorates the battle with a dinner. Charlie good. Mm. Wentworth always attends. The 25th is the day after tomorrow. I do my homework, too. <laughs> You could talk to all the surviving officers there. No, there's just one particular officer I'm interested in at the moment. If you want to know the time, ask a policeman. If you want to know about a regiment, ask the adjutant. And in this case, he was, for most of the time, a George Matterson. Look, isn't it possible to leave the dust undisturbed? No. I mean, if you had to investigate every skeleton and bone that was ever unearthed... Mr. Matterson, this happened in our lifetime. The circumstances are suspicious, and that's reason enough. Yes, well, there must be other matters. Yes, I was reminded of that by a letter written to the Times by 
Hugh Brunton MP. Also an ex-officer of the 29th, coincidentally. In our investigations, we keep coming back to the regiment, as if we were going round in circles. <sighs> yes. All right, what do you want to know? About Terence Parker. What sort of a man he was, what sort of a life he led, in the regiment and out of it. He was a scoundrel. Yes. And a coward. He wasn't a popular officer. His brother officers disliked him and his men distrusted him. Does that make him a coward? No. But deserting your men as they drive into battle... Well, tell me about that. Well, no doubt you've heard of the exploits of the 29th at El Abir in 42. Yes. Yes, well, we were deployed for battle. Now, Parker was in command of the leading troop, and as he came to the top of a sand dune, he was able to see the full strength of the enemy formation. And? His uh, troop sergeant had to take command. Parker had driven to the rear. But he'd be court martial for that, surely, wouldn't he? <laughs> he should have been. But he wasn't. Well, there was an inquiry, all right. Uh, Parker pleaded that he had been taken suddenly ill and was in no fit state to lead his troops. He complained of stomach ache. In fact, he was always complaining of pains in his stomach. His stomach? In fact, was he has no stomach for fighting. So what happened? Well, the colonel accepted his excuse. Why? What? It was a question of regimental pride. You see, the 29th is a regiment... I beg your pardon, I should say was a regiment of great tradition. And tradition breeds morale. And at that time, it was very high among the men. The colonel wanted to keep it that way. He thought that was more important than one man's cowardice. He felt that if he exposed Parker, it would reflect on the remainder of the regiment. He arranged for Parker to have a medical board. Well, these things can be arranged, you see. As a result of which, Parker was downgraded and posted back home. He spent the rest of the war behind a desk in the war office. And after the war? I don't know. Mr. Matterson. I've told you all I can. Have you? All I intend to, then. I'm sorry, but... Parker was the sort of person that deserved to come to a sticky end. Hmm. Anything new? Well, nobody liked Parker. Nobody trusted him. He was a coward and a threat to morale. That's it, then. They were all in it, the whole damn lot. Regimental conspiracy. You're out of your mind. If Parker was a threat to them. I said he was a threat to morale, that's all, and that threat was removed when he was posted back to the warhouse. No, we still don't know enough. Get on to the war office, check what department he was in, what job he was doing. Or, oh, in his medical record, both Lady Oxborough and Matterson referred to his stomach condition. Right? What have we got there? Bricklayers working on the building in 1946. There are 28 of them. Nine have subsequently died, six can't be traced. Most of the remainder scattered all over the place. Of those that died, one had some form. Nothing very really startling. Petty theft. Got three months in 1945. Name of Joseph Brellis. Now don't tell me he served in the 29th, too. No, but he had a brother who did. Well, you've been earning your keep for a change. Someone has to do the real work. Mm -hmm. John Brellis, corporal, awarded the MM at El Hibir. He was Colonel Wentworth's driver, and he stayed with Wentworth for some two years after the war. Oh, no. Where is he now? In uh, Australia, Port Kembla. Uh, emigrated, 1947. Well, you might be right for once. What? A regimental conspiracy. Get on with it. What? The War Office. What was Parker doing between 42 and 45? Right. Uh, sir, I, I strongly advise against it. W will I feel... Yes, sir. As you wish. <sighs> Miss Hardesty, would you get me Chief Superintendent Kingdom at New Scotland Yard? They don't like it. Warhouse, coppers asking questions. Nobody likes it. What's the answer? Parker was shifted around a bit. <laughs> Nobody wanted him. But he spent most of the time in a department dealing with officers' records. Kingdom. Uh, Chief Superintendent, it's Madison here. I have just had a call from Sir Giles Wentworth. He's a little disturbed by all this newspaper publicity. He won't last. Uh, Sir Giles was wondering how much progress you'd made. Well, some. As a matter of fact, we were wondering if we might come and see him. Um, 
Well, yes, naturally he wants to help you in any way he can. As he suggested that you might like to meet. Now, we have our annual Elabir dinner at the Dragoon Depot in Chelsea. Yeah. Now, some of us meet in the anteroom beforehand at about seven. Uh, Sir Giles suggested you might like to join us. Oh, I would indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Madison. Goodbye. General wants to see us. We've been invited to the Dragoon Depot. Pre-dinner drinks. Big deal. Yeah, well, I think so. Medals and decorations will be worn. I'll look at my flower pot badge. Well, it looks as if we're getting somewhere. Parker worked in a department dealing with officer records. Blackmail. Uh, <clears throat> may I introduce Chief Superintendent Kingdom and Sergeant Ward of New Scotland Yard, Lieutenant General Sir Giles Wentworth, gentlemen. Do appreciate you coming all this way down to see us. I suppose the correct form is for us to come and see you. Well, not always. As it is, we have the slight advantage playing on the home ground, as it were. This is not really a game, though, is it, sir? Quite so. It's just that I feel more comfortable here. I suppose I... <laughs> I'm getting old. Uh, let me introduce you to the others. Dr. Stephen Lewis, ex-Royal Army Medical Corps. But he overcame that disgrace by serving as the 29th MO during the war. We adopted him. And now, he's as much a dragoon as the rest of us. Mr. Kingdom. Mr. Brunton, like so many politicians, he's an inveterate writer to the Times, as you no doubt know. Yeah, how do you do? And Sir Geoffrey Oxford, deserted us for the diplomatic corps some time ago, makes the battles now instead of fighting them. Eh, hey, Oxford? Something like that, sir. Yes, I had the pleasure of talking to Lady Oxford. I'm afraid the pleasure was rather one-sided, Mr. Kingdom. My wife didn't relish the experience altogether. Uh, making people uncomfortable is one of the least pleasant aspects of our job. Can we get you a drink, or is sure. that not allowed? Oh, no, a gin and tonic, please. And, um... Uh, Detective Sergeant Ward. I'd like a beer, sir. Gin and tonic, a beer. And the same again for us. Yes. Were you a soldier, Mr. Kingdom? Uh, yes. Royal Corps of Military Police? <laughs> Does it show? <laughs> no, a logical guess, that's all. No, I only caught the tail end. Oh, the finale wasn't as easy as all that. No, I'm afraid my contribution was rather undistinguished. Were you commissioned? Oh, no, a sergeant. Salt of the earth. Even a red cap sergeant, Mr. Matterson? <laughs> um, may I? Sir. Uh, uh, oh, gin and tonic for me, please. Tonic. Uh, Thank you, that's for me. Thank you. Uh, uh, cheers. We're uh, <clears throat> beating about the bush, rather, aren't we? Well, perhaps you care to come through here, sir. Well, I don't want to waste too much of your time, sir. Wretched business about Captain Parker. I wonder how much you know. Well, a fair amount. And we've guessed some. His conduct at Elabiel? Yes, I have told them about that, sir. People don't set much store by the honour of the regiment nowadays, do they? They label it so much twaddle. Honour, pride, they don't count for much. Unfortunately, for old so-and-sos like me, they're still very important. So often they tend to qualify our behaviour. I suppose we need a code. The younger people don't. Not today. And Terence Parker? He made his own code. After El Abir, I got rid of him. Unfortunately, he landed up in the Department of the War Office where he had access to certain records. It's a golden opportunity for a man like Parker. You know more than I imagined, Superintendent. Professional guess. He had access to a certain amount of personal details. I suppose by then, he resented the regiment. So he decided to use so many personal aspects of the uh, officers of the 29th. He um, stored the information, and when the war ended... Blackmailers only need hints. He would only need to find a few uh, incongruities in the relevant records, use that as a basis, and... And sniff out the rest. 
Standard modus operandi of the professional blackmailer. How many of your officers were being blackmailed, Sir John? Well, I don't suppose we shall ever know now. They say everyone has something to hide, don't they? I did. Do you have to know all the details? Uh, not necessarily, at least uh, not at this stage. It was Oxborough who came and told me about Parker's activities. I didn't see what I could do about it at the time. By then, I'd paid him a great deal of money. How much, Sir Geoffrey? 11,000 pounds altogether. <clears throat> 6,000. A lot of money in those days. He chose his subjects carefully. Those who had money, those he knew had influence. Filthy trade. He was bleeding us dry. He had to be stopped. Oxborough. Even my wife, a woman Mr. he was... Jeffrey. Supposed... Let's get to the night when Parker died, eh? Parker said he wanted to see me. He said he wanted another 5,000 pounds. He knew I'd just left the army to join the foreign office. He knew that any blemish on my record would destroy me. Well, I wasn't prepared to give him that kind of money. In desperation, I rang Sir Giles, told him the whole squalid business. And I went round to Parker's. I knew I was going to kill him. When I got Shall there, I, I said... Shall I take over, Geoffrey? As soon as Oxborough had contacted me, I decided to go and appeal to Parker. To appeal to him, sir, or to threaten him? Good point. To do either, I suppose. But on the journey over, a thick fog developed, and my driver had difficulty in finding the way. Corporal Brellis. You're very thorough, Mr. Kingdom. And when you arrived at Parker's house? I was too late. Too late? For what, sir? Parker was already dead. He was in pyjamas. There was a service revolver on the floor beside him. I knew that Oxford... In my opinion, Parker deserved to die. I didn't see why any decent man should have to suffer for his death. So you decided to get rid of the body? Yes. And your driver, Corporal Brellis, helped you? Parker was shot in the head. There was surprisingly very little blood. We put him in the boot of the car. Just a minute. Let me finish, Geoffrey. Are you sure you want to, sir? At this time? Certainly. My driver said he knew how we could get rid of the body. He had a brother working on a building site. There was a, an old generator room to be bricked up. The brother met us there. Sir Giles, you thought that I killed Parker? I didn't know who killed him. I didn't much care. I presumed it must have been one of you. Good God, he was dead when I got there. He was already dead. The gun was on the floor beside him. It was suicide. It had to be. Well, why should he want to commit suicide? He was raking in all that money. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Actually, it does. I've had to keep quiet up till now because of a thing called professional etiquette. But I think I'd better say my piece before any further damage is done. Yes, Doctor. In November 1945, I came out of the army. I set up in private practice. And one of the first patients to call on me was Terence Parker. And a rather expensive consultation it was, too, for me. Parker was in a very distressed condition. His stomach? Yes. And blasted dyspepsia. He was complaining of that at El Abir. As it happens, it wasn't dyspepsia. It was terminal carcinoma of the stomach. So that was... Oh, poor devil. I only discovered this later, after the war. I had to tell him he had a very short time left to live. And it would have been a painful death. But he refused to go into hospital to die. I don't blame him for taking the easy way out. I think I would have done the same. So if I'd phoned the police when I first found the body... Or if I had. None of this would have happened. So there was no excuse for what I did? None whatsoever. The damn fool things we do sometimes. Yes, well, thank God that matter's settled. I'm afraid not. Oh, you can't possibly... Thank you, Madison. But I'm certain Chief Superintendent Kingdom knows his duty. He knows what action he must take. The action he is bound to take. I'm sorry, sir. Will you want me to go with you now? Uh, no, sir, not immediately. I don't see why you shouldn't dine first. Answer, Geoffrey. Thank you, Mr. Kingdom. Well, no doubt you'd like to greet your guests now. Thank you. Not so many of them left now. We lost a lot at El Abir, you know. 
Come, gentlemen. I wonder if old Bellamy will show up this year. Promised faithfully he would. Is there nothing we can do? He's an old man. He's devoted his whole life to serving his country. This will destroy him. I don't think so. The German panzers couldn't do it. I don't think this will. And it was a long time ago. God, almost before I was born. Parker's name was never even mentioned. In all these years, no one even spoke of him. Please proceed, gentlemen.